Good afternoon and welcome to our neuroscience lecture series. I'm Dr. Gala Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation this afternoon. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America, the Caribbean, and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you will have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located in the bottom of your screen. I will be your moderator for today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Jervina Whiting. Her presentation is titled, Innovation in Spine Surgery. Dr. Whiting is a neurosurgeon at Baptist Health Miami Neuroscience Institute. She specializes in endovascular neurosurgery, complex spine surgery, and general neurosurgery. Dr. Whiting received her medical training at University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and completed an internship in general surgery at the University of Florida in Gainesville, followed by a residency in neurosurgery. During her residency years, she received numerous honors, including the Charles or Chuck uh, Shank Award in Neurosurgical Excellence in the in the and the Cherry Apple Resident Travel Award for an outstanding resident abstract at the Congress of Neurological Surgeons annual meeting. In addition, Dr. Wyden completing, completed a fellowship in endovascular surgery at the University of Florida. Prior to joining Baptist Health, Dr. Whiting was a private practice uh, of a doctor in an, or in an Orlando hospital and board eligible uh, physician at the time. Dr. Wyden previously was an assistant professor of clinical neurosurgery at Columbia University. Dr. Whiting is a member of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons and the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. She has lectured and presented uh, research findings uh, at medical meetings and published in medical journals. Uh, please let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Jovina Whiting. Dr. Whiting, what a pleasure to have you with us this afternoon. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Akeem. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the uh, invitation. Um, and I really am looking forward to this opportunity. And thank you to everybody who's joined us. Should I share my screen now? Yes, uh, please do. Okay, everybody sees that all right? All right, terrific. Um, well, thank you again for having me here today. And today I would like to take you through um, some treatments and innovation in spine surgery. Um, as uh, was noted, I am a neurosurgeon here at Baptist um, Health in Miami. And I've been here for about eight years now, almost eight years, I'm coming up on eight years, uh, and have really enjoyed it quite a bit. It's a wonderful community that we have here. Uh, and it has allowed me to really grow. One of the great things about Baptist is that we have uh, excellent resources. So in terms of doing my job, uh, we are really able to stay um, pretty much uh, at the cutting edge of uh, spine surgery development um, because we are able to um, enjoy all the resources that we might need to do that. Um, I'm gonna start with some basics and then I will take you through um, the way to kind of look at spine and current spine surgery, um, largely from the point of view of a non-spine surgeon uh, to sort of try to take people through uh, where we go and how we get to someone like me and, and when it's the right time to send a patient to me and what we might be able to do uh, to help them. Uh, please feel free to ask questions as we go along. All right, so um, this is just a very brief brush up on the spine anatomy. Um, and uh, as we all know, the spine is made up of bones called vertebra, and you've got the uh, shock absorbing soft tissue in between, which is called a disc. Uh, and then there are ligaments and tendons and also muscles. Um, there are cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebra. Really, when we're talking about the spine, very little of the sacrum or the coccyx comes into play clinically, although um, sometimes a little bit of the sacrum. Mostly, though, particularly when we're talking about spine surgery, we're talking about cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. Uh, the spine function uh, is multifaceted. Of course, it provides stability and structure for the body, uh, but it also acts as a protective covering for the spinal cord and the nerves. Uh, and importantly, this provides an anatomic pathway from the brain to the rest of the body. 
Joseph Pilati, I don't know if this is really his quote, but I found it multiple times associated with him. And, and this is the person who um, came up with the sort of uh, extremely popular core strengthening uh, programs today in philosophy. And he said, you're only as old as your spine. Um, I think that that's true. Uh, I remember the days when my spine felt like this. Um, but unfortunately, most mornings, my spine sometimes feels like this. And there's a question as to how you get uh, from this spine to this spine, even though it seems to happen to pretty much everybody. Uh, and, and that's kind of where I do my day to day um, is in that process and trying to keep people's spine and spine health in a um, younger and more functional uh, state. Uh, so really, the overwhelming um, contribution to the need for spine surgeons in certainly in um, the North Americans and certainly in the world, I would say, is degenerative disc disease. Uh, so this is a blanket term that's used to describe the deterioration of one or more of the disc spaces of the spine. Really, uh, this the degeneration typically seems to start at the disc space, and it's not really that surprising. Because if we think about the way we, we age in terms of our skin, in terms of um, our hair, uh, we are losing hydration in our uh, soft tissues and the same sort of thing is happening inside our bodies. And so the disc spaces uh, are a real target of that. And as they lose hydration, they lose elasticity and they lose um, resilience. Uh, and so instead of bouncing right back into place, they can start to bulge or even herniate, which I'm sure is a term that uh, pretty much all of us have heard. Um, this is extremely common. It increases in incidence uh, with age, and that's because this is a normal part of aging. Uh, the frequency is roughly described in proportion to age. It's just an easy way to remember it. So when you're in your 40s, about 40% of people have some sort of evidence of degenerative disc disease, uh, but about 80% of people do by the time uh, they reach their 80s. Presentation and symptoms of degenerative disc disease uh, is usually some sort of radiculopathy, although most commonly you will hear patients uh, describing it as sciatica. Um, it's dysfunction of a nerve root, uh, and it's usually sensory first, or at least sensory is usually what brings people to our attention because people do not like pain. So pain is the most noticeable symptom, uh, and that's what typically causes somebody to actually take time out of their day, take time out of their work schedule, whatever, and schedule an appointment with a physician to try to figure out what's going wrong. Um, other distressing symptoms that can be uh, noted would be numbness and tingling, and that can sometimes really worry people. Uh, a lot of times people think they're having a stroke or something like that. It can be very disconcerting. Um, motor function is another problem. This is less common uh, for uh, various reasons. The sensory function is usually affected first. Um, motor function, we tend to think of as more serious, even though patients don't always. Patients are often really, really focused on the pain part of it. Uh, but for someone like me, it's very uh, worrisome to notice that somebody is having a problem with their motor function, like a foot drop, because that's when uh, long-term function uh, starts to be uh, threatened. And so uh, it's extremely important to us to try to make sure we don't miss that window of opportunity to stop that from becoming permanent or long-term or debilitating. Radiculopathy uh, is the word that we use for um, pain, or dysfunction in the distribution of the nerve root. And so the thought here is that the problem is happening uh, at the level of the nerve root where it is leaving the central nervous system. Um, and this is causing symptoms that radiate down an arm or a leg. Um, the pattern matches up, I'm sorry, turn off my phone, sorry. Uh, the pattern matches up uh, anatomically to the origin of that particular nerve root. And so while patients might think that there's something wrong with their leg or something wrong with their arm, uh, typically the problem in this kind of scenario is going to be found in the spine. Um, a lot of times patients will come in and say they have nerve pain uh, and they're right. It's a little hard to, do, to understand why they would know that, but it is a different kind of pain um, than a sore muscle. It's a different kind of pain than direct trauma. Uh, and people often uh, kind of know and instinctively describe it as nerve pain. Uh, it can be debilitating. 
uh, chronic pain decreases your overall quality of life. I think there's a lot of evidence and a lot of uh, work that's gone into uh, talking about how chronic pain can really um, spread and sort of affect many other areas of a person's life. Um, it leads to major changes in your lifestyle and your activities. Um, and it threatens people's abilities to work effectively. And I, it can even go further and start to interfere with their interrelationship issues and things like that. It can really be overwhelming. Cervical and lumbar are the most common sites of radicular symptoms. The thoracic spine is a little more protected from degeneration. It's not that it doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen as frequently. Um, so typically what you're gonna see is somebody who's coming in and they're either complaining of pain running from their neck down into their arm, typically often into a particular finger or going down their leg, the back of their leg, the side of their leg. The distribution of that is very helpful to someone like me because that helps me start to identify which area specifically, which level of the spine might be causing the problem. Degenerative disc disease is extremely, extremely common. So uh, population-wide, uh, probably at least 85% of the population, I wouldn't be surprised if actually it's more than this, have some sort of ridiculous symptoms during their lifetime. Most of these episodes are self-limited. Um, so most of the time, this stuff doesn't even come to the attention of a physician. A lot of times they're going to come to the patients will do their own um, conservative uh, therapy or will start it. They will see chiropractors, they will see um, massage therapists, uh, sometimes acupuncturists, things like that in the community uh, where they are trying to um, treat and address the pain that they're having, but it may not ever reach it to reach someone like me or to their primary care physician. Um, in terms of overall ways to look at degenerative disc disease, the treatment arms for persistent pain are either going to be conservative versus surgical. And conservative, again, is one of these sort of blanket terms um, that uh, surgeons use to describe all non-surgical um, treatment. So basically, if it's not surgery, we're going to we're going to bucket it into conservative, but really that's a very large and specific bucket that is uh, run by some extremely talented people, as I'll get into a little bit later. Um, so the conservative or non-surgical treatment um, includes a large variety of options, and really this is the mainstay of most people's uh, neck, back, ridiculous style pain because only about 10 to 20% of patients wind up requiring surgery. The really important thing for me to communicate here and something that I've learned is really uh, is equally important for me to talk to my patients about is that just because 80%, 80 to 85% of the patients who have back-related pain, neck-related pain, radicular-related pain, don't wind up requiring surgery, it does not mean that that is not legitimate pain, that those aren't, that there aren't real reasons why that's happening. And it doesn't mean that conservative treatment is some sort of less legitimate treatment. The pain is very real. It's just that not everybody has pain that can or should be addressed with surgery. I do believe that everybody's pain can and should be addressed. So there's a distinction there. And I um, think that sometimes um, it's important to validate uh, our patients' uh, experiences and what they're feeling and the pain uh, that they are feeling and make sure that they understand that we are trying to offer them the treatment that is best for them. Um, and that surgery is not necessarily a better treatment than another treatment. It really depends on who they are. We need to cater and customize our treatment plans for each individual patient. Uh, and sometimes that takes extra communication so that they don't feel like they're being um, disregarded. So obviously diagnosis is where we start with these things. And this almost always starts with a primary care provider. Um, sometimes, however, it can be uh, emergency um, room providers and, and emergency doctors because there are, at least in the United States, there's a lot of um, unfortunate situations where we don't always have people uh, who have primary care physicians. So a lot of people can sometimes wind up utilizing their emergency um, uh, department physicians as more of a primary care style thing. So um, we do wind up working pretty closely with the emergency um, providers, uh, even for some very non-emergent situations um, in terms of back pain, because people just don't know where else to go. 
um, when they feel like they've had enough. Um, most of the time you'll see something like this when the radicular pain is lasting more than a couple of weeks, because after a couple of weeks, people are really starting to worry about it or they're starting um, to have to change their lifestyle or they're having a hard time going to work. So uh, pain that's not responding to the types of things that we do for ourselves, like NSAIDs or Tylenol, um, and the other types of things that can bring people to our attention very quickly are neuro changes. People um, typically don't like to be weak or to have uh, numbness that they can't explain. Uh, any episodes of urinary or bowel dysfunction, I hope, hope, hope brings people in to see us right away. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't, uh, but that's certainly something that we sit up and, and pay a lot of attention to. Um, most of the time, primary care physicians can and should offer initial um, conservative treatment. They're very, very capable of doing this and uh, are well trained uh, in trying to figure out when something really sets off a red flag versus when um, something might respond to um, less invasive styles of uh, treatment. Uh, Anti-inflammatory therapy is a mainstay. Physical therapy helps a lot. <clears throat> and weight loss is a basic tenet of everybody who takes care of spine. Um, the closer you can be to uh, normal uh, weight, the less strain you're putting on your spine. Uh, if there are worrisome factors or if the initial efforts don't work, this almost always leads to imaging because it's difficult to know exactly what's going on without getting a look inside. This is an area where things have changed quite a bit. Uh, when it comes to diagnosis, even just in the last 20 years, things have changed a lot. But if you think about the fact that this, uh, this picture here on the right is a very real medical illustration, ancient medical illustration. It's not a joke, uh, but when I look at it, I really see, you know, the operation game. So uh, what was what was top line uh, medical text back then uh, now looks almost laughable to us. Uh, and the reason for that is because we have things like this. So uh, we have really been lucky to be alive in a time, in my opinion, where uh, technology has advanced and, and we can really uh, get a lot of help with treating patients that way. Um, when we start, a lot of times the x-ray is the sort of typical and traditional, and sometimes the only thing available if you're in a rural area, if you're not in a spot where there happens to be um, access to CAT scan or MRI, uh, the x-ray is often the first place uh, to go. Um, it is not uh, as informative as a CT or an MRI, um, but it's still often used, especially with traumas or um, as an initial uh, picture to make sure you have normal alignment. There's not some sort of obvious fracture. A CT is certainly a step up in terms of information that's available, um, particularly about the bones. As you can see here, there's excellent definition of the vertebral bodies themselves. Uh, you just sort of see some gray space where the discs or the nerves or the spinal cord might be, uh, but it gives us excellent definition of the bones. And of course, as the CTs get better, even that gets a little bit better. Um, this is very quick. Uh, this is a large uh, donut. So even claustrophobic people can tend to handle this very well. Um, it's excellent for emergency situations because it will immediately tell you with great sensitivity whether or not somebody has an acute fracture. Um, and uh, it's widely available most of the time, not all the time, but mostly time. It is uh, not good for nerve and spinal cord definition. Um, it has radiation associated with it, and it is expensive still. And I should add to that, it's not available everywhere all the time. MRIs um, are really this gold standard for diagnosis of degenerative disc disease. I mean, it's in the name, it's disc disease, and MRIs are our best option for seeing the discs. Um, here, this is an MRI, and I don't know if you can see my error or not, but uh, this is a nice big fat disc herniation that's come out of the L5S1 disc space and is uh, compressing the nerve root here. Uh, and this is just easy, and this is just really one, one view, um, and you can almost immediately see what's going on. So this is a great study if you have the time, if you have the money, if you have the availability um, to be able to see and define what's going on. Uh, 
it is very difficult for claustrophobic patients. And sometimes we wind up having to get creative on trying to figure out how to make that work for them. Uh, and it takes a lot longer than a CAT scan. So it's not as good for emergency situations. Treatment of degenerative disc disease. Um, this is uh, typically, as I said before, either conservative, non-surgical, um, or surgical, but conservative is almost always considered first. It is less invasive, i.e. safer, it is less expensive, and it is frequently successful. In terms of conservative treatment, there are a wide variety of options available. There are medications, there's physical therapy, there are specialized exercise programs. Weight loss, as I said before, is a mainstay and cannot be overemphasized, although it is often very difficult to know the best way to address this with patients, um, because it, if you're not careful, uh, it's pretty easy to unintentionally alienate them, um, because there's a lot of social guilt and, and personal feelings of insecurity uh, associated with weight issues. And so it is, um, it's one of those skills that you kind of have to intentionally hone uh, throughout your career when you know that you are going to have to really talk to somebody about something that is um, delicate, but cannot be ignored. Um, and is a, a major part of doing it. So uh, everybody has a different way of doing that. And it's, I think, at least for me, um, a work in progress. And I learn um, probably every week uh, new ways to try to be a little more sensitive about that while still getting the message across. But it's extremely important. Injections, uh, that's like epidural steroid injections, facet injections, trigger point injections. There's a whole list of uh, types of injections that are often helpful um, and still considered conservative. They're a little bit invasive, but not like surgery. So conservative spine therapy has been around since ancient times. Again, we look at this and I thinking to myself, this is something from the Spanish Inquisition. This is like some sort of torture device, no way would this be found today. And then I walk into my physiatrist partner's office and I see, hmm, may, maybe this sort of thing still is in play. Um, complicated, but you never know. So this is something people have been trying to figure out ways to address back pain um, for as long as people have been drawing pictures, as far as I can tell. Um, it's come quite a ways, but then again, uh, there are a lot of similarities even to, to way back then. Uh, here at Baptist, we have a really robust um, and excellent team of um, physiatrists, physical medicine and rehab, uh, and pain management specialists. Honestly, I'm looking at this, and I think it's possible it's even grown since then, but I'm not real sure. Um, these are my physiatry partners. Uh, we all work very closely together. Uh, we are in constant contact with each other. And I think this is one of the really nice things that Baptist has to offer. Um, it's collegial and we are all under the same leadership. And so we share our patients and it really cuts down in the, we're able to do things very quickly um, and appropriately for our patients because we're able to communicate so well. Um, We have a combination of physical medicine, rehab, we have allopathic doctors, we have osteopathic doctors. So we really cover a very um, wide range of opportunities in our spine center. Um, and they do a lot, I mean, the number of patients they see compared to the number of patients I see is crazy. But again, that's because there's a large chunk of patients who, who don't need spine surgery, but they do need um, spine doctors. And so that's where this um, comes in. Um, and then when surgery is needed uh, or when they feel like a surgical evaluation is needed, they just call me up or they call up one of my partners and then we arrange that. Uh, this is just the locations uh, here in South Florida. So they're at, at multiple different spots. Um, okay, so moving on to stuff that uh, is a little more germinal to me. Uh, when do you refer for a surgical opinion? Uh, the most common reason is persistence of symptoms. So pain is the most common. Uh, most of the people who come to me, it's because they have been in pain and no matter what their primary care physician has tried, uh, maybe no matter what their physical therapist has tried, uh, depending on sometimes even their pain management, um, physicians have tried, they've got pain, persistent pain. Also persistent paresthesias or numbness is a good reason to wind up in my um, office. 
Um, and again, less frequency, frequently, there'll be neurogenic symptoms. If there's weakness, if there's persistent or severe numbness, or if there's any bowel or bladder dysfunction, that almost always uh, gets somebody into my territory uh, immediately, uh, because those are the types of things we call red flags. And those are the types of things that we worry uh, could be leading to some sort of uh, permanent disability in a very short period of time. So that kind of makes them skip the line of the conservative efforts most of the time. And that's the kind of thing that could get them um, straight to the emergency room or to my office uh, for a more immediate evaluation. Uh, so specifically red flags would be a significant neurologic deficit. And by that, that's just using three words to say weakness, right? So the real thing we worry about for that most of the time is weakness. Um, hyperreflexia uh, or exaggerated reflex, deep tendon reflexes is a more subtle um, finding that will often make somebody worry that there could be compression of the spinal cord and that that might be the like sort of earliest sign and that they should probably get them over to someone like me to make sure things don't get worse. Bla bowel and bladder dysfunction are also very, very worrisome. They should never be um, ignored. And if that's going on, somebody needs to figure out why. It's not normal. Uh, and it doesn't always have to be from the spine, uh, but we really do need to try to figure it out and make sure that there's not something reversible happening that if we address it soon enough. Uh, severe pain uh, that is just refractory to any kind of intervention is a bit of a red flag. Um, and then, of course, there are things that are more radiographic red flags instead of clinical, uh, like spinal cord compression. Um, edema or uh, myelomalacia or increased signal, when we say signal change, that's like a bright spot on T2 and the MRI uh, in the spinal cord uh, or, or really clear or severe nerve root compression. These are the type of things that uh, you sort of do not pass go, do not collect $200, just go straight to the uh, neurosurgeon and see what's going on. Um, you know, we get a lot of uh, questions about whether or not you have to have an MRI to refer the patient. Um, at this point, obviously, I'm going to need an MRI at some point, but it is easy for me to get that. And uh, waiting until a primary care physician or somebody in the community is able to convince an insurance company uh, to obtain an MRI is not always the best way uh, to provide good care for the patients. And so I am very happy uh, to see patients who haven't been able to get their MRI yet uh, in my clinic. I can confirm that that's really what they need. And then I can order it myself. Uh, the only thing is that that's sometimes a little bothersome to patients because they don't get the full answer in their first visit. And that can sometimes be frustrating. But I think it's better to risk that frustration um, than it is to accidentally keep somebody from the care that they need for too long of a period of time. So I think we, we have to not be rigid and not be dogmatic about these sorts of things and kind of respond to the, to the circumstances that are there. Um, uh, and, and maybe where they live, they can't get a good quality MRI. So maybe it makes more sense for them to come to me first and then uh, get an MRI either through Baptist or somewhere else in the community where we can um, have quality assurance. Uh, there are a lot of different things that go into it. So as I said before, about 10 to 15% of patients with degenerative disc disease will ultimately be appropriate for surgical treatment. There are a lot of different types of surgical treatment and a, a comprehensive, um, uh, way to address that is not part of this particular talk, um, but maybe 10 to 15% of patients who have this type of pain are going to need uh, surgical treatment. Um, usually in the typical non-red flag scenario, that's considered after a thorough trial of conservative therapy has been tried and failed. Um, and while I think there's kind of this idea that you don't want to have surgery. I agree with that. You don't want to have, well, you don't want to have unnecessary surgery. So I think we do need to remember that surgery is an excellent option for a select specific group of patients who are suffering from degenerative disc disease, um, but we have to be very careful about how we apply that so that we make sure we're doing the right thing for the right people and that we get the right outcomes. Uh, as I said before, there are a lot of different surgical options for the spine. This is a challenge when we're talking to people in the community because uh, understandably, uh, somebody whose grandma had a lumbar fusion um, 
may not be able to, from the outside, see how vastly different uh, that might be from uh, somebody else who's just having a lumbar discectomy or who's having some sort of cervical um, surgery. They just hear spine surgery and it's sort of all lumped into one when they're very different. Uh, my overall philosophy is to do the smallest surgery that will take care of the patient um, with the least uh, foot, with the smallest footprint and the least amount of inv invasiveness. So surgical treatment um, really runs the gamut and it can go from, from these very small, uh, minimally invasive type approaches uh, to something that's a lot bigger. Um, so this is kind of a picture format of the process of probably the most common surgery I do, which is just a lumbar microdiscectomy. Um, and I do that through a minimally invasive approach. So uh, this is the tube that's docked down here. Um, you can see the tube here, and then we're, we're operating with a microscope and we're, we're looking down at this. Uh, and then, so when we take the tube out, this is really all we close. And this is what the patients see uh, at the end. And, and through that tiny little incision, we can take out a, a pretty nasty disc herniation. Um, that's a nice, easy, um, simple one, uh, but it can get a lot more complex as you can uh, see with this picture. Minimally invasive spine surgery is extremely popular um, currently, uh, and there are a lot of different ways to describe it, but basically it's just talking about surgical technique where the goal is to minimize the amount of muscle, soft tissue, bone disruption um, for the approach to the surgical site. So really, when we're talking about minimally invasive spine surgery, we're talking about trying to minimize the approach situation um, to getting down to where we have to really do that, that surgical release of a nerve. Um, there are several potential benefits for the minimally invasive approach. It's safer, there's a lower blood loss, there's less post-operative pain, this leads to shorter hospital stays, or maybe for some people not even having to spend the night in the hospital when 15 years ago, there'd be a two or three night stay. Um, there's less need for post-operative pain medication, which is a huge thing today, um, given the complications of uh, some opioid treatment. Um, and there's shorter surgery time, which is just better for everybody. Uh, it's used for a variety of surgical approaches. Uh, as I showed you those pictures before, there's microdiscectomies, which is a really common way to use it, and probably the way most people know about it. Um, it can be used for other types of degenerative um, disc disease, spinal stenosis, spinal fusion, spinal fractures. Um, this is an example of uh, the tools that we use. And so over here, these are the dilators. And basically we use these to push the muscle out of the way um, because that's the way that we minimize the amount of muscle disruption that's done. We used to have to make an incision down the middle here and then peel all of the muscle off of the bones all the way out to here. And now we just sort of go right through it, but just sort of gently move it out of the way until we can get a tube down. And that's our working quarter. And that's how we um, visualize and get down to where we're at. And obviously tools have been developed that um, can be used through the tube, uh, et cetera. It's not just discectomies. It's not just small things that can be done through here. Uh, percutaneous screws are the mainstay of how I do most fusions. Uh, so that way it, it has really limited and changed the way that we do uh, lumbar, particularly fusions, because it has decreased the amount of blood loss. Uh, because instead of um, peeling everything back and making a gigantic opening from here to here, I can just directly stick those screws percutaneously through the skin, um, and I can make as large a construct as I need to while still maintaining that minimally invasive philosophy. A lot of what we do today is a hybrid, where maybe the decompression is what we call a mini open, where you do a small opening in the middle to decompress the nerve roots, and then the screws go through percutaneously. Um, Another uh, one of the things that we use here a lot at um, Baptist is intraoperative navigation. And this is essentially, you really think of it as GPS style technology, uh, where an intraoperative CAT scan, and this is called the O-arm, and this is how we get our images that wind up looking like this. So after the patient is asleep and the, um, the approach has been completed, we bring this in, we get images, and those images are registered to the patient uh, so this line here represents 
a tool that the surgeon is holding on the patient and on the screen, it shows the trajectory through the bone and that's in real time. And that really uh, facilitates accuracy and safety when it comes to things like uh, placing a screw because we can essentially visualize exactly where we're placing it. We're very lucky at Baptist uh, to have um, really all of the latest options for image guidance here uh, in our uh, department and the hospital has been very dedicated to making sure that we stay up to date on that. And we as surgeons have been very interested in doing that. So that is a, an extremely robust part of our department here and particularly of my um, degenerative uh, spine program. Uh, all of the surgeons who work uh, with me are capable of using this and, and, and do we do encourage them to use it uh, in, the in the surgeries. These are my partners. Um, this is the spine team. In fact, it has actually grown recently and I have not updated my, um, my slide. I need to put one more little face in there. Um, but these are, these are my uh, partners. And together, I feel like we offer an extremely comprehensive uh, product to South Florida, as well as to our international Baptist community. Um, we're very happy to help. We're trying to make people's lives better. Um, and uh, I, I'm just very thrilled to have this opportunity to uh, share what's going on with us. Just give you a little peek at what's happening here with us in the spine um, department here at Baptist Hospital. Thank you so much, Dr. Whiting. That's uh, a beautiful recap of what uh, we do at uh, m and and especially in your department. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we have a quite a large audience. I wanna remind everyone, if you wanna share some of your thoughts or if you do have questions for Dr. Whiting, please go ahead and use the Q&A um, feature located in, right in the center of your screen. And I'll make sure to read those questions to Dr. Whiting. In the meanwhile, um, I, I just wanted to, uh, I mean, that's mind boggling. 85% of the population, I mean, that, it, that you just woke me up there with uh, that percentage alone uh, that suffers from degenerative disc disease. And, uh, and some of them just go and notice or simply don't do anything to resolve pain or to address the pain. And oftentimes we do get a mix of these individuals that do have uh, these type of conditions, but more importantly, they might be an, uh, an, an underlining for other conditions as well, neurological conditions as well, that uh, may be misinterpreted uh, or simply not diagnosed appropriately. Uh, you did mention that some of our patients here in the States, and I'm sure around the world, they, it happens almost in the same fashion, they do not have a primary care, or they do not have a person that actually can help them diagnose, or in some countries, they do not have the resources or the technology. So when we get some of these patients, yes, they come for, with an MRI, perhaps there is a bulge here and there, uh, but uh, uh, how do we determine that a patient is definitely a neurosurgical case versus a neurological case, such as other symptoms that are in addition to the typical degenerative disc type symptoms that can also uh, cover some of the most worrisome of conditions in the neurological sense. You know, that's an excellent question. And it's um, there's not an easy short answer to it. I guess the the real answer is we can't necessarily. Um, obviously, one of the things that all of us in the, whether we're physiatrists in the non-surgical arm, whether it's neurologists who want to make sure they're not missing a surgical um, issue by concentrating on a neuro neurological issue, or whether it's me, we try to always have in our minds that we have to really make sure everything is fitting, right? So if I have a patient who comes to me and they have a presentation, they have an MRI, it's got a disc bulge, um, it's got some narrowing, it certainly could be um, causing some irritation or compression of the nerve root, but somehow their story doesn't sound right. They're having urinary retention, and this is just one nerve root that's being um, compressed. 
Um, they're having symptoms on the other side of the body. Um, their tongue is fasciculated. Some little thing, if it doesn't quite make sense, we have to sort of learn to trust our um, aha moment uh, and, and think, okay, just because I see a disc there, that doesn't mean that that's what's causing these, these symptoms. And so part of what we do every day is make sure that we're not just looking at an MRI. Um, we're not just looking at a CAT scan. We are looking at the patient's exam and we are listening to their story because that is the best way to put all of those together. And again, very lucky to have the resources. Um, we're here at the, um, the Neuro Institute, we actually have neurologists as part of our group. And so uh, anytime there's a question, uh, we reach out to our colleagues and try to make a multidisciplinary um, approach. And that is the beauty of uh, m and uh, it, it, The fact of the matter is that you rely as well of, on your peers, either yes. psychiatrists and or neurosurgeon uh, or um, neurologists to actually help you care for that particular patient. So uh, everybody rest assured that uh, the approach is encompasses many yes. specialties if need be. Um, we have a, a comment from Ana Catalina, who is a, our representative in Costa Rica, and she says, thank you for the presentation. As a matter of fact, a patient from uh, Merida in Mexico will be having an appointment with you <laughs> at the center on October 27th. Where I agree All right. Thank you. Well, so, we are going to uh, do everything we can to make that perfect. Yes, yes. Uh, and then I have uh, here also a comment from uh, Loretta Bethel from Bahamas. She goes, uh, I am from Bahamas. What are the signs of urinary bowel dysfunction? Okay, so, um, you know, this can actually be trickier than it sounds. It, it kind of feels like, oh, that should be, you know, easy, but it's not. First of all, as people age, their urinary function changes, and that's a pretty natural thing to do. Second, particularly, um, the thing that's trickiest is that people can be retaining urine and not know it because if it doesn't hurt, then they don't really know. So we don't measure our output usually. And as long as people are continuing um, to urinate every day, uh, they may feel like this is normal when in fact they're urinating only a few milliliters with each output and they're retaining um, urine, it's getting bigger and bigger. It's extremely common. Um, the types of ways that we pick up on that are to ask really specific probing questions like, do you feel like you're emptying your bladder? Do you feel like you're putting out as much as you used to? Do you feel like you have to go a bunch of times? So one sign would be that um, patients are now going to the bathroom um, five, six, seven times in a morning when they used to only do one. This can get tricky when we're dealing with men of a certain age because there are also prostate issues, but that's very unusual for women. Another um, sign of that is recurrent uh, urinary infections uh, because that is an indication that they may be holding on to urine and allowing um, things to colonize. Um, by the time there's incontinence, uh, sometimes there's already been some dysfunction for, for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And, and um, some patients do come complaining of uh, chronic pain mm -hmm. um, and, and they know it's lower back. They haven't done much about it, but uh, they complain of this horrendous, severe pain in one of their legs. Uh, and uh, uh, oftentimes we find that it's slightly too late and they have to go to the emergency room uh, to be taken care of. Uh, almost immediately. Uh, is there a correlation between that particular sciatical type pain and uh, bowel uh, dysfunction as well? Not usually. So usually when you have just um, specific radicular pain, I don't, yeah, usually when you have just specific radicular pain, that's one nerve root that is being um, compressed. And usually that does not come with bowel and bladder. Having said that, when you do have a scenario where the whole cauda equina is being progressively, slowly, day by day, more and more compressed, and people just aren't really paying that much attention to these more subtle urinary um, symptoms, it may very well be the pain that brings it to your uh, that leg pain that brings it to your attention. And the reason for that is because really acute radicular pain is similar to a terrible toothache. 
it can't be ignored. And so it might bring, uh, it, it's, you do have to have that in your, in your mind. You do have to ask those questions and really probe because it might bring somebody who's been sitting on some really low level urinary um, dysfunction for a long time, that might bring them into you. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, um, patients opt for uh, pain management uh, where, uh, you know, they go directly to an anesthesiologist so they can help them out with that. Um, do you find that that is uh, the most appropriate course of action in, in some of these cases? Or should they honestly uh, stop, not go through pain management and come directly to the neurosurgery? Um, I, I don't think there's a, a really uh, simple answer for that. I think that the way that we have, well, first of all, that's what those red flags are about, right? If there are red flags, they should never um, start with pain management. They should go to the emergency room or they should go directly to someone like me if there's a red flag. But most people don't have red flags. Um, on the other hand, you don't want your patients being taken, you know, um, you don't want them undergoing unnecessary procedures when you know if it's mm -hmm. obvious that's never really going to help. Part of, of what I like so much about the system we have here is that our pain management people are part of our group. Mm -hmm. They're all very well vetted. And so when, when patients are triaged to them first, it makes it very easy for me to feel comfortable and to know that they're not going to recommend um, an injection if they think that patient needs to be evaluated for surgery and that they're going to send them over to me right away. So it comes down to your community. And if, there, if, if you can develop relationships with some of those pain management people so that you know who to trust and, and, and to help educate them on when to send um, to neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. There are so many more physiatrists and pain management specialists than there are surgeons. Mm -hmm. Your patients might be waiting forever if we don't utilize that. But I do think that it's, it's best when there is good communication relationships between the surgeons and the physiatrists. And it boils down to the model that we currently have at Baptist, which is an interdisciplinary approach, again, yes. uh, to everything that we do. Yes. Uh, therefore, you definitely, you said it beautifully, uh, if one of your peers sees that it's not something that it's uh, suited for that particular patient, then immediately is discussed with uh, a higher or different types of specialists. Yep. Uh, Rebecca Brooke, uh, Brooks is from Grand Cayman and she says, great presentation, thank, thank you. you. Uh, what are the recommendations for uh, piriformi syndrome, please? Are they uh, the same as uh, for sciatica? Um, well, it depends on um, whether the belief is that the sciatica is coming from the piriformis. And so if you are feeling that the nerve is being trapped there, then there's gonna be a lot of overlap. Um, I send all of my people with suspected piriform syndrome to uh, Dr. Tolchin in the spine center because he's excellent at it. Uh, there are a variety of things that can be done. It really depends on what's going on with the patient. The mainstay is often stretching and activity modification but there are also injections. And I know that he does um, targeted injections, both to diagnose and to treat. Uh, Loretta has a question for Bahama. So she goes, uh, what is a foot drop? Uh, can I find your email about this hospital web? And the answer is yes. And I'm gonna share with you later on uh, the, um, the way to actually reach to our international department. And of course you can find uh, Dr. Whiting in uh, our website. So more to come, just hang in there. What is a foot drop doctor? So a foot drop is um, when you cannot dorsiflect um, the foot. Uh, and typically when I'm worried about it, uh, this is because the L5 nerve root is under some sort of duress. Um, and it's one of those things that if you get to it very quickly and you decompress that L5 nerve root, most people can have a really nice and maybe even complete recovery. Um, the way that patients typically notice it is that they start tripping because they can't pull their foot up. They, as they're, they can't lift their foot up. So their foot just hangs like this. Um, it, there, it could be a, a perineal nerve, a peripheral issue. 
Um, but when it comes from the back, you want to get to it as quickly as possible. And I would just recommend if you see somebody with a foot drop that's new, send them to an emergency room. They probably need immediate um, imaging. That's kind of one of those easy triggers to pull. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, Anna Basile um, is asking, uh, where does a chiropractor fall in the category of treatment? I personally do not feel confident with going to a chiropractor for back pains or symptoms. <laughs> so I'm going to be very careful here. <laughs> I want to be... That's what I'm smiling. It's kind of it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's constant. That particular question always comes. <laughs> um, I will say that chiropractors are important because um, people trust them. And um, they are very, very often the first line to see your patients. And so I do my best to maintain a good relationship with the chiropractors in our community. And I do my best to make sure that I don't say anything to their patients that would sound um, derogatory. And I think they actually uh, often provide a very good service and they help a lot of people with pain. Uh, I, my particular training um, suggests that a chiropractor is not the most appropriate person to be treating someone who has an anatomical problem in their spine. And that is better served um, from uh, somebody like a physiatrist or somebody like myself. So they are a part of, I, I they're a part of the big picture um, and and there's somebody that a lot of times patients feel comfortable talking to and going to first. Mm -hmm. uh, Carlos is asking, uh, would it be possible via international department to make an appointment with Dr. Whiting? Are you kidding? Of course. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, the answer is immediately yes. Uh, you can reach us at international at baptisthealth.net and we will make sure to refer you immediately to Dr. Whiting if you need assistance. Do not wait too long on that back pain if you're suffering from it. Thank you, Carlos, for your question. Um, and then Maseli is in Honduras. She's our representative in Honduras, and she is wondering, uh, there are people who wait too much too long using a lot of methods to ease the pain, but they need surgery. Can they have permanent damage? How long they have to wait before this occurs? So um, yes, you can certainly have permanent damage if you um, leave a nerve root compressed for too long. So the basic philosophy is if you have pressure on a nerve root, the first thing you wanna do is take that pressure off. Um, but the longer the pressure is on it, the harder it will be for the nerve root to come back to normal. Um, and so uh, again, that's part of why it's important to um, send your patients to uh, somebody who is educated in this specific style of situation, because what we want to do is examine that patient, look at those images and really listen to what the patient has to say to see if they are likely in danger of that. There's no answer for how long they have because it just depends on how serious the compression is um, for them. Yeah, uh, Dr. Basile agrees with you. She says, thank you, Dr. Whiting, great presentation. Oh, so uh, Roberto Campos, uh, what would be the recommendation for a trauma injury where I have a nucleus pulposus uh, protrusion from L4 to L5 and from L5 to S1 without involvement of the spin spinal canal that they, that generates pain with efforts such as lifting weights or lifting objects. Yeah, so this is one of those more difficult situations because when you have these early degenerative signs um, like disc bulging on your MRI, but you can't clearly see where a specific nerve root is being um, compromised, uh, it becomes a little more difficult to, to figure out what to do. I, I would say the first thing to do is to make sure that you are concentrating on your core strengthening, probably even more than concentrating on um, other weightlifting style stuff, because the stronger you can get your core, the more protected that disc space is when you try to lift something heavy. Um, it, 
I don't have a perfect answer for that. And that, that would really require looking at the pictures, looking at the patient, that sort of thing. But in general, um, when you're trying to be able to maintain your normal level of activity, but you do have some degeneration in your spine, um, don't skimp on the, don't skimp on the core, um, strengthening stuff that is super duper important as a foundation. I can attest to that. <laughs> Definitely. I can attest yeah. to that. Uh, firstly, I want to congratulate, says Rosanna, uh, congratulate Dr. Whiting for a fantastic presentation. Oh, thank you. I, ha I had uh, surgery uh, two months ago uh, for a second time within nine years due to uh, spondylolisthesis and compression of the nerve in L5-S1. That second time, it was L4, L5. My question is, how long this numbness on my thighs uh, will last? And also uh, this shooting pain that I feel that I still have on my opposite leg where surgery was done six years ago, uh, trying conservative treatment and injections before surgery. Will I still need more spinal surgery in the future? Well, Roxana first, is from London. What's that? Ro Roxana is from London. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm really sorry that you've gone through that. Um, that sounds like a, a very difficult thing to have to experience, and it is super frustrating to have the surgery and then still have symptoms. Um, I, I want to uh, do your question justice, and I have to say that I, I don't think I can give you a good answer because that's very complicated, and I would really need to um, look at images and uh, get a, a detailed history of what's going on with you. I will say that there is um, uh, that there's often years of opportunity for things to improve, especially things like pain. And just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean that there isn't an answer that could get to that. So I would maintain hope, but I have to stay general and vague about this because um, to, to give you any detailed opinion, I'd need more information. Uh, Roxana, I just typed uh, our email. Um, and you can reference Dr. Whiting, this conference, and my name as well. I would love uh, to help you out and see if we can get those images to Dr. Whiting for her opinion um, before you prepare to do something else. So we'll be happy to assist you. Uh, Carlos, it is always our pleasure. So let us know if you need any assistance so we could refer you to Dr. Whiting. Um, and Loretta is back and she says, the pain in my back is now in my left hip <laughs> muscle and, uh, and the heel when getting up from a sleep position after walking a bit, um, it, it goes away. Yeah. So I guess she is just uh, adding to uh, her yeah. initial concern. Now, Dr. Whiting, uh, you know that if we will keep you here, you will be up to midnight uh, responding. <laughs> so you've been extremely generous uh, with your time. And I want to make sure I thank you on behalf of our entire team at International uh, for this phenomenal presentation and the opportunity you gave us today uh, to talk about this incredibly, incredibly important topic. If you do have additional questions for Dr. Whiting, uh, please send them to BHI webinars at baptishealth.net. I promise we will make sure to get them to Dr. Whiting for her to respond and send them back to you. Um, and, um, and like that, uh, you will be on your way to actually better life and going back to normalcy. Uh, well, we look forward to seeing you all in our next neurosurgical lecture series, which is scheduled for January 19, 2022. I want thank, to you. thank you once again, Dr. Whiting, for, for your time and uh, for this great presentation. And to all of you for participating this afternoon, please stay safe, get vaccinated, help us out so we can get to normal life. Thank you, Dr. Whiting. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. It is our pleasure, doctor, anytime. Thanks. Bye everyone. Bye.